Well, welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's Wednesday, November 2nd, 2016, and I'm your host, Margaret Howell. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, U.S. intelligence operatives are covertly trying to save America, as it has now been confirmed that the WikiLeaks emails exposing Hillary Clinton did not come from Russia, but rather an inside job from the intelligence community, who are sick and tired of the rampant corruption of crooked Hillary. Then, as their biggest fear may come to light, the latest FBI bombshell that is sure to hand the election over to Donald Trump. Plus, Vladimir Putin has a message for Europe. You have no future if you continue to accept Muslim migrants. All that Всего plus much more need. up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. We have confirmation that it was U.S. intel ops on the ground in Washington, D.C., and not those bad old Russians that Hillary Clinton keeps trying to blame very unsuccessfully that actually hacked into her emails, uh, the Clinton campaign emails. It wasn't Russia. Now, uh, this coming from numerous sources from the Podesta hack, uh, which then led to them getting into the hands of Julian Assange. We have an article. Uh, it's been confirmed the U.S. intel operatives leaked this, um, actually came from on the ground in Washington. Numerous sources have told this to Alex. They didn't want to be named on camera, but the motivation for doing this, of course, is an attempt to save America from a Clinton presidency because they know that uh, Clinton, um, you know, she's very rampantly corrupt, very dangerous, and uh, they were concerned with how she mishandled the classified information as far back as 2009. When officials from the National Archives became aware of the violation of the record-keeping procedures uh, that the, uh, the Department of State uh, Hillary Clinton was presiding over, they decided to take action. Now, she's repeatedly insinuated that Russian agents were responsible for the release of these emails. Of course, we know that simply isn't true. She even had the audacity to threaten military action against Russia because they had hacked into her server, her homebrew server that was set up in her little closet. Turns out it was all bull. None of it was true. It was a smokescreen. And uh, they were trying to blame the Russians, of course. Now, this was backed up by a British ambassador, Craig Murray, who traveled to Washington for a dinner. He was able to confirm sources on the ground directly that back up everything that were saying that it was, in fact, insiders on the ground in Washington and not Russia. Now. Former Deputy Secretary of State Steve Pachinik uh, talked to Alex Jones, breaking a record silence about the coup that is underway in Hillary's camp. We had had a uh, civil coup that was initiated by Hillary and her cohorts based on corruption and political cronyism. We had a counter coup, which was initiated several days ago by some of the people in 16 different organizations, as you mentioned. However, there's been more and more information coming out, and now we are concerned that two people are specifically targeted by our intelligence system. One is Uma Abedin. The issue of Uma Abedin and her connections to Saudi Arabia and the Salafists, and particularly with those Salafists or Imam who funded al-Qaeda and subsequently, uh, presumably, Osama bin Laden, she is a very... Uh, concern target for us. And the reason for that is the question is, she was born here in the United States, left after two years. How did she come back in 1996, get to the top of the uh, ladder, the political ladder, and become an uh, assistant to Hillary Clinton when, in fact, her connections, including her mother, her brother, and others, are very much tied in with the Wahhabis, Saudi Arabia, and the government? The answer from my perspective, and possibly from those who I work with, is that she's very much of an agent uh, of influence and both an uh, operative and infiltrator on behalf of the Saudi Arabia. And that's why she had the 650,000 emails reportedly under the name insurance on Hillary gathering data. And the question is, who gave her the top secret clearance that she had received after having been here only two years after 1996? Who, in fact, in our three-letter agency, worked in Saudi Arabia? 
There's only one agency. It's either Catholics in action or the CIA, John Brennan, who has been very close to the Saudi Arabians, and also the Israelis. Now, why do I talk to, about both these issues? The ultimate distraction in this whole storyline with Uma Abedin and Anthony Weiner has been to me somewhat of a farce. It's been a either contrived or combination of you know ongoing problems, but a highly contrived scenario, which distracts from the fact that Uma Abedin is very much of a Saudi agent. However, she married a Jew, uh, you know, a, a pathetic Jew, but nevertheless, that neutralized the notion that she was a total Saudi influence. Peter Katchik was brought into the Justice Department as a result of being Podesta's lawyer, and Peter Katchik got Podesta off of criminal charges. Podesta, who's as stupid as the day is long, made a comment saying, this is my kind of lawyer. He makes sure that I never go to prison. So what we have is a Jewish law firm, Dixine Shapiro, with a Jewish representative, Peter Katchik, who is in turn going to evaluate and investigate a corruption trial with Uma Abedin. That's, an, that's a complete farce. Now, the media, the mainstream media, they are shaking in their boots because they know that the FBI bombshells, it could spell out a victory for Donald Trump. They're echoing this. It's almost hilarious. Uh, they're not even concerned with the fact that Hillary is an, an ardent criminal that's an ineffectual leader and everything that she touches turns to crap. You know, that's of no mind that, that she actually engaged in criminal activity. No, what they care about is the outcome of the election, win at all cost. And specifically, um, you know, the FBI in relation to the bombshell that they're reopening this case, the subject of mainstream media largely focused negatively on Comey and not Clinton. Uh, the fact that she'd sent this classified information from her homebrew server. One one study, it was done by a, a, an organization called Media Research Center, and they looked at news coverage from a Friday to a Monday, and consistently reports from ABC, NBC, CBS, they were overwhelmingly negative towards Comey, and only 31% of the time, roughly one in three times, did they actually call out Clinton for her illegal activity. Now, the most pertinent part of this, the most important part of this information, the Washington Post editorial board, it said, and I'm directly quoting here, no one should be happy that the outcome of the U.S. presidential election could be affected if not determined by a cryptic letter from the FBI director released 11 days before the, before the vote, but that is our unfortunate situation. Well, guess what? Uh, you very inept, defunct media. It's not your situation. It's the situation regarding the American people. And everyone has a right uh, to know exactly what was sent, exactly what she did, regardless of the outcome of the election. Now, speaking of the defunct media, we cover the New York Times frequently here on InfoWars. And astonishingly, there is a report that says that 95.7% they fell in quarterly profits, which is remarkable. Now, last quarter, their shares were only six cents a share. They can't give it away. Uh, but specifically, their net profit attributable to the newspaper publisher, it fell to $406,000, are just breaking even per share in their third quarter. Now, to read that uh, direct uh, little tidbit of information, you would think that they were on the verge of collapse. Well, according to Mark Thompson, uh, who heads up the New York Times, he's pretty much saying that things couldn't be better. This is what he had to say. He said the quarter proved yet again that the New York Times is a very compelling digital revenue story to tell. We saw exceptional gains in our digital consumer business, more than twice as many as the same quarter last year and far more than any other quarter since the model launched in 2011. So just the fact that that statement is pretty out of touch if you really think about it. He's saying, look, our digital gains are great. Well, guess what? Uh, your shares are worth pennies on the dollar and you basically can't even give it away. And maybe that's because you don't really cover issues that people care about. And specifically, we are in a war. We're, we're not where Western Europe is. We're not there yet. But with a Clinton presidency, we very well could be. There is a war going on right now on the streets of Paris. And uh, armed migrants are seen fighting each other in the streets. We've seen this since the closing of the Calais jungle. They've moved to the north of Paris.
I hear French officials on the ground. They are so out of touch. They actually deny that uh, people from the Calais jungle have migrated, dis despite the fact that cameras are on the ground and they're interviewing migrants that actually can speak English. And they're saying, look, we came from Calais. We got a bus ticket or a train ticket. And many of the times, uh, if they can't afford a ticket, they just get on the train anyway. And uh, we've seen what they're doing. Now, that specifically was in the northern part of Paris. It was around the Stalingrad metro, and it was turned into a refugee battleground. What we see are these rival gangs of migrants, and they sat upon each other with, with violence, with billy clubs, riding in the streets. Meanwhile, pedestrians are simply walking past, uh, you, you know, victimized by what they're seeing, powerless, helpless to do anything about it. This is falling on Halan's doorstep, and yet he's denying that they have a problem. You know, this situation makes Merkel's immigration policy actually look somewhat organized, which is a really tough thing to say because, wow. Uh, but they have a serious problem. Meanwhile, the media and officials, the globalists in charge, no problem, nothing to see here. But normal people with half a brain can actually see that there is a problem, and Putin even remarked, on the situation, he warns European countries that they have absolutely no future if they don't get a handle on the migrant crisis and establish some law and order. Now, he says a society that cannot defend its children today has no tomorrow. He said he's totally bewildered at the fact uh, that European countries are taking in so many migrants and it's increasing the number of rapes sweeping the continent. Of course, we know that the mainstream media will not cover these rapes. They absolutely refuse to do it. But we covered this specific rape case that uh, President Putin highlights. And it's the case of the 10-year-old boy in Vienna that was raped by an Iraqi refugee. The refugee was uh, ultimately the charges against him were dropped because they were able to say effectively that the refugee did not know what he was doing to the 10-year-old boy was in fact raped. Now, he claimed he had a sexual emergency and that he didn't understand that the boy didn't want to be raped. Oh my gosh, we are really in for it. Uh, he says, it didn't fit into my head. Uh, what on earth are thinking over there? That's what Putin has to say. And I couldn't agree with him more. The rationale, it's like the inmates are running the asylum and uh, rape cases like this of this 10-year-old boy, unfortunately, they are a dime a dozen. We hear about so many of them, but you really have to dig, especially in mainstream media, because they completely ignore the fact that this is directly related to the migrant crisis that is underway. And by the way, if Hillary Clinton has her way, she's already said it. She's going to ratchet up the refugee uh, population coming in, non-vetted refugees, mind you, because our Homeland Security Department, it is not equipped on the ground to vet these refugees. She doesn't care. And uh, what's happening in Vienna? This is absolutely what will happen here if Hillary Clinton has her way. And the president of Russia is even remarking on it, saying he is totally bewildered at this fact. Now, we know that uh, regarding the refugee crisis, ISIS has infiltrated uh, military populations, refugee populations, and they are proud of this fact. It is unbelievable. There is one specific article that is so troubling to me when I read it. I, ne I nearly, uh, you know, sick to my stomach doesn't begin to describe it. So the Islamic State, they have this magazine. It's called Nashir Now. And they published um, an article asking lone wolves living in Western Europe and the United States to begin attacking. And specifically, I'm directly quoting, this was written in English as well as Arabic and French. And this is what they had to say. Every soldier fights on the caliphate land in Iraq and Syria, wishes to be in your place, meaning wishes to be in Western Europe or America. We can cut the tail off the snake, but it sooner will grow again. But you have its head. Brave Mosul is bleeding. You should stop its bleeding by carrying out exhaustion operations on the enemy's power and blood. Cut their heads by your own knives. Let us hear your guns blasting their heads. If, if this doesn't make your stomach turn, and yet our politicians, like Hillary Clinton, they are totally ignoring these facts. Because to look at the facts, you know, a moratorium on uh, populations that are coming out of ISIS strongholds, we're not properly vetting them. She knows that. And the globalist in charge, the elitist running amok, uh, wanting our country to go to hell in a handbasket, frankly. They, they see what's happening on the ground in, in France and Western Europe. They want it here. This rape case, you know what? When Clinton is in office, God forbid, we will be covering these night after night after night, rest assured. Now, the president 
uh, took to a stage in Ohio this week. And the nerve of this guy, so, and forgive me for calling him this guy, the President of the United States, he basically insinuates that if you don't vote for Hillary Clinton, you're a sexist. So if you don't accept her policies, her radical view of immigration, uh, the fact that she doesn't want any borders at all, uh, you know, the fact that she's possibly a Chinese operative, if you don't want her, well, you're just plain old sexist. He takes to a stage, he refuses to call Donald Trump by his name. He calls him the other guy. How disrespectful is that? So I'm just gonna start from the top. This is what the president had to say to this crowd. There's a reason why we haven't had a woman president before. The guys out there, I want to be honest. Well, that's a, I guess there's a first for everything right there. He's, he's trying to be honest, but then he goes ahead and lies and spins this ridiculous narrative that uh, because she's a woman, she deserves to be president. So he says, you know, there's a reason we haven't had a woman president before. And we have to ask ourselves as men, because I hope my daughters are going to be able to achieve anything they want to achieve. And I know my wife is not just my equal, she's my superior. Well, isn't that sweet? We all want men to love their wives, but the way he's going about this, playing the woman card, it whiffs of desperation. It reeks of desperation. Vote for me, I have a you know what. That's her only selling point. And look, Celebrities are taking uh, to the airways in this desperate, hilarious attempt. They're saying, look, we know you don't like her. We know she's hard to stomach. We personally can't stand her either. But please, please, please go out and vote for her anyway. She's a woman for crying out loud. And the president, the audacity of him, uh, you know, to, to say that uh, Hillary is electable simply because she's a woman. Well, that's absurd. And then he says, the guy is going to be your champion, referring to Donald Trump. Don't be bamboozled. We all had a good laugh when Hillary Clinton first tweeted out that all survivors of sexual assault deserve to be believed. After all, it's completely ironic considering there was countless women who accused her husband Bill of sexual assault and they were completely vilified not only by this sycophantic Clinton media but by Hillary Clinton herself. But there was one person in particular who wasn't laughing at all, Kathy Shelton. Now at 12 years old, Kathy was raped and beaten so viciously that she was put into a coma for five days only to wake up to the doctors telling her that she would probably 99% chance never be able to have children. And in 1975, Hillary Clinton defended Kathy Shelton's attacker, Thomas Alfred Taylor, even though she knew he was guilty. Hillary Clinton herself personally and coldly interrogated sixth grader Kathy Shelton. She blamed the rape on her. She used insane tactics that would be illegal today under rape shield laws. Uh, Taylor was able to get off, which is a few months in jail time for raping and nearly murdering a 12 year old girl. So not only with this case do we get a huge reveal into, you know, what kind of a champion for women and children Hillary Clinton really is. We're beginning to see just where Hillary Clinton started to learn how to manipulate the law in her favor. I'm joined now by Kathy Shelton and her attorney, Candace Jackson. Also, you're the author and you guys have the uh, website, theirlivesfoundation.net, reaching out to a lot of people um, about this topic. And we really thank you for coming here today to share your story uh, with us. And I know this is really difficult for you having to relive this, um, but if you could please just sort of describe what happened that day? And I was um, going to church with some friends. I was going to ride my bicycle there. It's a couple blocks away. And my mother didn't really want me to, but I talked her into it. But she was going to pick me up that night um, in the car, and we, which we've done before, and you know, throw the bike in the back and um. On the way, riding to the, to the people's house, two men got out of a truck and approached me and um, scared me and said I was going with them. I tried to get away, but I couldn't. They uh, forced me in the truck and um, started, I was screaming and crying, and it was like no one could hear me. or. Um, 
and we went to some road out. I'm not sure the name of the road. All I know is there's a lot of fields. I remember seeing a lot of fields and stuff, and they're ripping my clothes off and beating me. And and and, and out there they raped me, and I was left out of the truck on on the ground and uh, unconscious at one time. I came to consciousness, or I may be saying that wrong, but um, I crawled to a um, a porch out of nowhere because I didn't see no houses out. I got to the porch. I never know. I think the man up above may had something to do with it, but um, I knocked on the door and the porch light came on. They were coming back to, to finish killing me, and I think they already thought I was dead. And when the porch light came on, it scared them, and she got their tag number, and that's how they got them and arrested them today. T today, that's how they got them. Mm. Um, I woke up five days later in a hospital with a coma, uh, out of a coma, and was told that uh, I could never, it was 99% chance that I could never have children again and had several stitches in my private parts. Just so incredible. And then, so it didn't really end for you there because um, this was such a vicious attack, almost a murder. It, it Something had to be done about it and you were brave enough to speak up, maybe tr trying to pursue pressing charges. And at that time, here comes this woman, Hillary Rodham, who is now, um, basically putting you on trial and making you present the case of, of you know, t t blaming you for what happened to you. T tell us what that was like for you to be interrogated and um, victimized again. It was, well, it was like being dramatized again. Not only the rape, but it was like being re-dramatized and it got so bad that she put me through so much hell that I asked my mother to take me away from it. I couldn't take it no more. <laughs> Never take me back there. I don't care what happens. And I prayed to God after that that I forget his face and, and never see him again. I think he pretty well did because um, last night I was trying to talk about what he looked like, and I was unable to do it, and, and I kind of got... So upset, I almost was crying then, and I just had to take a walk. I spent four hours trying to describe what he looked like. Yeah, there's there's just no words, I think, that, that can describe what impact uh, this has on a 12-year-old who, who's not only violated this way, but then made to feel at such a young age like it's her fault, uh, like she's the one lying about what happened, being told by the by the female defense attorney not... I'm really sorry this happened to you, but I've got a job to do. I've got to ask you some questions. But being <sighs> coldly interrogated by this woman who then pushes this girl into a lie detector test and accuses her of lying and, and faking and making things up, uh, talking about her like she's scum in the sense of saying you're on the wrong side of the tracks, asking the court to order a psychiatric exam because she's prone to making things up and exaggerating because she comes from what Hillary called a disorganized family. Single mom. Mom's a single mother. That's what Hillary Clinton went on the attack with to say, therefore, she can't be telling the truth. Therefore, she seeks out older men and fantasizes and romanticizes sexual experiences like that. Things that had no foundation in fact or reality at all. And these were things that Hillary Clinton chose to throw at this young victim. It's classic blame the victim tactics that would be outlawed under all the rape shield laws state by state today. At the time, Arkansas didn't yet have its uh, rape shield law, but you would have expected a, a self-proclaimed feminist like Hillary Clinton not to need a rape shield law to avoid blame the rape victim tactics in order to defend even a guilty client. Mm. And Candace, you can kind of speak a little bit because a lot of people I know uh, when this story kind of um, resurfaced, Hillary Clinton she was able to just kind of quiet it down and say, well, I had an obligation to represent my client and I was forced to take this case. Um, is, is that a fact or? 
We have worked very hard through Their Lives Foundation this year to dig into the case because so far the mainstream media has been willing to take at face value Hillary Clinton's own denials, explanations. We have been able to begin to uncover hard evidence between court documentation and uh, witnesses that have never been uh, spoken to before begin to confirm what really went on. And almost every single piece of the story that Hillary Clinton has chosen to put forward in her autobiography, in audio taped interviews she's done about this case, turns out to be flat out lies, starting with the fact that she was never required to take this case. This was a voluntary decision on her part. She, te she herself tells inconsistent stories. Did the, she at one point says the prosecutor called her and asked her to take it as a favor to him, okay? In another place, she chooses to say that the prosecutor said, the, uh, I've asked the judge to appoint you to this case. So her own story is inconsistent, but whichever explanation, even if it were true, neither means that she was mandated or required to accept this case. She could have said no. She could have said a 12-year-old victim raped that brutally, almost killed. Boy, I, 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 I'm a rape culture advocate. I can't do that. She absolutely could have said that. No, she wanted the case, we think now, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, she's a young, ambitious attorney at the time, might make her feel big and powerful to take on a challenge and win her case at any cost. Two, she happened to philosophically agree with the, the, the progressive Democrat philosophy shared by the judge in this case and shared by the prosecutor in this case that uh, things like rehabilitation is more important than punishment. Let's not punish these terrible criminals too much. Let's give them a chance in society. That's a liberal philosophy that she held, Bill Clinton held. When the president gives the order, it must be followed. Scott Isbell is an artist for Wu-Tang Productions, and he has become popular with his song Trumpified, but since then, he's been censored and hacked on social media. This shows the bias on social media. All right, Scott, so tell me about some of the bias or censorship that you have experienced being on YouTube and being pro-Trump. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's been crazy since I, I started supporting Trump, and, uh, uh, I mean, last February, well, so I put out this song called Trumpified last December, um, and, and the response has been pretty crazy. I mean, it's gotten over 110 million plays to date, and um, I mean, it was it was this number two song on the website in its entire history on SoundCloud, but, um, you know, back in February, I was hacked by uh, pro or, or Trump protesters, and um I mean, they del they deleted. I had 17 million YouTube views. They deleted. They took my Twitter. Um, they took my Facebook. I never got my Facebook accounts back. I never got my Instagram accounts back. Never got my Vine back. And you know, so I, I contacted Google and uh, Facebook. And as soon as as soon as they found out I was a Trumpified kid, they literally stopped responding altogether. Um, you know, my management tried to even contact them to know having we just none of us had any success so you know i never got my youtube views back i never got my facebook accounts back i never got most of my social media accounts back um and you know i mean i've gotten i've gotten hundreds and hundreds of death threats sent to me which is which is pretty crazy because you know who knew that writing a pro trump song would 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 piss that many people off um and you know uh, the the threats have been everywhere from uh, you know everywhere from you know calling me a Hitler Youth Corps member to uh, to uh, you know throwing crazy homo homophobic slurs at me to uh, 
to, you know, sending death threats to my, my own family members, um, saying you better not come to this city, otherwise, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna bomb you, or just like really obscene stuff. And, um, you know, for, uh, for the left to always try to think that they are, you know, accepting of others, uh, the reality is, uh, you know, I've, d I've dealt with the exact opposite from them. Um, you know, just the amount of hate, uh, the amount of belittling towards me, even in school, um, you know, just I've been belittled a lot for supporting Trump. And honestly, a lot of it's been behind my back because I don't know, I just I think a lot of I think a lot of the left is pretty spineless, to be honest. And, um, you know, it's 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 been it's been crazy to to see that um, our movement is so strong that that it, it scares them. Yeah, and this is almost a form of soft censorship where, you know, you're an up and coming artist and you hit big with the song Trumpified. I imagine that's the biggest song that you've ever uh, come out with, the most views that you've ever gotten. And um, basically, they, I guess, accidentally, they won't tell you how all of your views went away, why your social media accounts got suspended. And now all of a sudden you had to, I guess, did you start a new YouTube page to try to get your music out there? Is that what you've done? Yeah. So, so yeah, you have to yeah. go back out and, and basically start a new and you lose all those views, you lose all those subscribers. And this is kind of a form of soft censorship, what they do to you when the message that they don't like makes it big in the industry. That's crazy that you actually had to deal with this. And I imagine, you know, you're at a pretty liberal university at uh, Emerson. I imagine you deal with a lot of bias there. I know you're a very outspoken Trump supporter. Talk about some of the bias you see at the at your university. Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, I've, I've had comments um, where where students will have, um, say that my my pro Donald Trump bumper stickers on my MacBook Pro make them uncomfortable. Um, the the fact I have a, a picture of Donald Trump on my MacBook Pro, um, you know, makes him uncomfortable. And um, you know, and, and and I mean, I was in political classes last year. And uh, to be honest, I mean, you know, all views were accepted until I started opening my mouth about Trump. And uh, especially especially the class when it came up talking about Megyn Kelly. And I actually <laughs> I called her a bitch. Because, because, you know, she had this whole feud with Trump and they're like, oh, Trump is so mean to her. And I was like, no, she's, she's actually not a nice person. Um, you know, she purposely puts people in the corners. And I mean, the feminists went nuts in my class. But, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to, to, to speak the truth so that millennials, you know, have a voice um, in this movement. Um, because, you know, the, the way I see it is, you know, my whole life I've been accepting of liberal views. I've been accepting of all views, and I still am accepting of all views. But if I'm going to be that accepting of everybody's views, then I expect the same in return. I expect them to to be accepting of my views, to not belittle me, to to not try to to silence me, or or say that you know uh, my my Trump bumper stickers are somehow triggering. I mean, it's obscene. Yeah, right. You're not trying to silence Hillary supporters. You're not telling them you're triggered by the stickers that are on right. their computer or you're not violent either, if we even want to go to that level. But exactly. you've also you've also pulled some other stunts uh, on your campus, too, for Trump. Have, have you not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had I had one in the, um, last spring where basically um, I yeah, it was last spring. I basically um, put out this this ad on Facebook and Twitter. Um, that basically it was supposed to be a, a pro-Trump movement uh, at Emerson College, um, but you know people didn't know I was behind it. There wasn't actually an event. I just made up the event and I said, you know, meet everybody who supports Trump. Meet at this classroom at this time on this day. Well, what happened is all these Bernie supporters and Hillary supporters all showed up trying to protest this this event. But it turns out, you know, I just had I had made the event fake. So they're standing there for hours trying to <laughs> protest an event. And I'm just, off, you know, somewhere else in Boston, just chilling. <laughs> they'll come out if it means that they can protest Donald Trump, oh, yeah. call him oh, a racist, yeah. say he's Hitler. They'll never miss an opportunity for that. Now, uh, tell me, let's talk about the support or what you've witnessed in the industry have has Wu-Tang Records been supportive of your outspoken support of Trump have they been supportive of you when you've been censored on YouTube and Facebook and other social medias have they been behind you and said 
keep supporting Trump, that's fine, and we'll keep supporting you? I mean, I've gotten, I've gotten mixed reviews. My manager, um, Jimmy Kang, was a VP of Wu-Tang management. I mean, I mean, he thinks I'm nuts to begin with, but honestly, he's a huge InfoWars fan. He loves all conspiracy theory things. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think, I think deep down, I think um, all of them truly have a respect for the fact that I speak my voice, I speak my mind. Um, but I also do so in a respectful way. I mean, I've I've never gotten into fights over politics. I'd be the first person to say I never want politics to, you know, get in between friendships, to get into between relationships. Um, I'm a heavy believer in, you know, once once we win this presidency, we're gonna we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna truly have to to start working, you know, with both sides. Um, and yeah, but I, I mean, I think um, I think it did scare Wu Tang management. Um, you know, I think they thought I was going to destroy my music career. Someone, I said, no, watch this. This is this is going to be magic. And so I, you know, I've just spoke my mind. And honestly, um, I mean, this this movement's been crazy. I mean, Trumpified is still the second most viral song on SoundCloud in that site's history. But I mean, it was on their it was on their top ten charts for six months. And then out of nowhere, they decided to, to, to uh, quote unquote, change the rules of, of the music charts. So now there's no actual algorithm to it. Um, and they, I mean, SoundCloud refuses to chart any of my songs anymore. Um, you know, even though I have one of the most viral accounts on their website, um, you know, it's just, it's just another case of, of, you know, these social media sites that are, are so anti-Trump that they'll do anything to try to censor us. Um, and I mean, it's, it's Trump fight, as I said, it's still second most viral song in, on that site's history, right behind that Panda song. And, uh, you know, but they, they try to silence me by taking me off the charts. You know, they SoundCloud loves to, uh, to skew with my numbers all the time. They, they, you know, Trump fight used to have over 101,000 likes on SoundCloud. Now it's down to. Yeah, and, and Trumpified basically launched you to a new level, got you all kinds of new listeners, got you great amount of views on SoundCloud, obviously took off. And But it's okay for you to know Katy Perry and Miley Cyrus and Madonna and Bon Jovi for all these people to campaign for Hillary, perform, perform at her events, you know, do all of these things on social media for her. But one guy comes out for Trump, and it's a huge issue. Scott, thank you so much for coming on with us, and best of luck in your future, and uh, I hope that People kind of leave you alone with your support for Trump and you continue to get more followers. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. America is showing Hillary Clinton and her accomplices the door. The FBI is underway on not one, but five criminal investigations into the iniquitous tentacles of Hillary Clinton. They include the reopened email case, an ongoing investigation into the Clinton Foundation, the investigation of Anthony Weiner's sexting of a 15-year-old girl which involved Hillary aide Huma Abedin, an investigation into the Podesta Group and its ties to alleged corruption involving the former Ukrainian president, and the investigation of the Clinton's ties into the illegality of Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe's foreign donation contributions from Chinese billionaire Wang Wenling. The Democrat are reaching claustrophobic levels of panic, blaming everyone under the sun but themselves. We do know that our democracy is under assault by, by the KGB. I mean, to me, that's something we ought to be talking about. That's a very pertinent, re relevant issue in this campaign. And people have to decide, do we want, do we want our country for ourselves and the people in charge, or are we going to let the, the KGB and the House Republicans decide this election? Sorry, Mr. Carville. Failing left-leaning outpost, the New York Times reported law enforcement officials say that none of the investigations so far have found any conclusive or direct link between Mr. Trump and the Russian government, and even hacked into Democratic emails, FBI and intelligence officials now believe was aimed at disrupting the presidential election rather than electing Mr. Trump. But Hillary keeps on swinging for the fences as she attacks her accusers. I'm sure a lot of you may be asking what this new email story is about and why in the world the FBI would decide to jump into an election with no evidence of any wrongdoing with just days to go. With no evidence of any wrongdoing. There is no case here. 
But even the former DNC committee chairman Ed Rendell cautions Hillary against attacking the FBI. Even the White House doesn't want to condemn the FBI. They are hedging their bets. You know, every time Donald thinks things are not going in his direction, he claims whatever it is is rigged against him. I, there was even a time when he didn't get an Emmy for his TV program three years in a row, and he started tweeting that the Emmys were rigged again. Should have gotten it. This, <laughs> this is a mindset. This is, this is how Donald thinks. And it's funny, but it's also really troubling. Meanwhile, Hillary can't even accept the election process. Reuters reports Democratic Party officials sued Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump in four battleground states on Monday, seeking to shut down a poll-watching effort they said was designed to harass minority voters in the November 8th election. In lawsuits filed in federal courts in Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, and Ohio, Democrats argued that Trump and Republican Party officials were mounting a campaign of vigilant voters intimidation that violated the 1965 Voting Rights Act and an 1871 law aimed at the Ku Klux Klan. Senator Ron Johnson is already preparing Congress for the impeachment hearings should Hillary win. Meanwhile, Trump's numbers keep increasing. Investor Business Daily shows Trump and Clinton tied after Hillary's lead disappeared. The stock market, a bellwether that has called 19 out of 22 elections, has been sliding in the recent weeks, spelling out the country's dissatisfaction of the incumbent Democratic Party's economic nightmare and heralding a win for Donald Trump. Hillary will one way or another have to face the will of the American people, as deplorable as she perceives it to be. John Bound for Infowars.com. Well, do you remember when Bernie Sanders said to Hillary Clinton, nobody cares about your damn emails? Turns out all of us care and WikiLeaks they just released their 26 batch of Podesta emails from the Clinton camp we have resident WikiLeaks expert in-house Joe Biggs to talk about this what did you find there've got to be some gems in this pile I care about them and uh, the <laughs> funny too. thing is though is the FBI and the DOJ actually the DOJ representative that they've entrusted to uh, head up this brand new investigation to the uh, the emails for the second time is none other than Peter Kadzik. Peter Kadzik is a guy who was just... BFF to John Podesta. Yes, just caught the other day giving a heads up in the brand new WikiLeaks. It says, there is a HUC oversight hearing today where the head of our civil division will testify, likely to get questions on State Department emails. Another filing in the FOIA case went in last night or will go in this morning. That indicates it will be a while, sometimes 2016, before the State Department posts the emails. So already giving these guys a heads up that they're going to be looking into it. And then I can show you millions of other emails where they literally discuss and have a play-by-play. -play. And the name of this uh, script, or this name of this email is called script. And they go over talking points about how to get rid of them, how they should do it. And then they come up with questions that they believe the media will ask them and then talking points to back away from it. And then they have unofficial remarks already planned to go off the record mm -hmm. to tell people, all right, yeah, we kind of screwed up. And they talk about that, and they don't care. It's sh they're shameless. They're shameless criminals. That's what we're calling them. Uh, and we do care about these emails. We think that you should, too. And uh, enough information in here, not only to embarrass her, it criminalizes her. This woman was caught sending classified information. She thought she'd gotten all those Blackberries with a hammer. She missed Wiener. Uh, thank God for Wiener, but what, the back door. what else did you find? <laughs> Just the, okay, so we have Kadzik on the table. We know that he's giving everybody a heads up, this corrupt little crony. Anything else that was explosive to you that well, stood Clinton out? Clinton Foundation, we all know that's pretty corrupt, but in here they even say this. Uh, here's one from Brent B. He actually uh, works for Huffington Post, and he's writing this to John. Some free advice, good advice, Clinton Foundation should cut off foreign donations ASAP. Uh, basically, uh, it will not publicly look good uh, later. This is my advice. That's one right here. Another one called foreign government donations. Sorry to be clear, foundation stops, meaning stop taking foreign government money. 
Is that possible? Yeah. If not, we're going to be very vulnerable on that throughout. And I think our opponents and some on our side will say it is unseemly for a potential U.S. president taking money from foreign governments for her private foundation. Unseemly to take money from the Saudis who chop off hands, club women in the streets, decapitate people, atrocious human rights record. They're, they're influencing the policy decisions that she made as Secretary of State, not to mention the Chinese. I mean, with that, we could spend a whole segment talking about that, uh, you know, swapping policy decisions for them for cash. But the only thing they care about is that it looks bad, not that it's Criminal. Here's another one. I could write a column listing one by one the corporate clients of many of Hillary's closest advisors and many Democrats would puke. I've researched this and it is appalling. And these are people attuned to making money from whomever writes their checks who are not attuned and in many ways are hostile to the powerful forces that are driving the electorate. <laughs> also, Despicable. another thing, George Soros has given $2,500,000 to it. So if you don't think that there's going to be any kind of trickery with the 16 states that own those uh, computerized, yes, those, you're mistaken. Luckily, deplorables, we outnumber the uh, people that actually are still brainwashed enough to vote for a career criminal like this. So our, our only method of recourse, because we know that Soros is controlling, he's the puppet uh, master behind pulling the strings. These smartomatic machines. There's a petition circulating to get the, those machines out of our system. I encourage you guys take a look at it. It's up on the White House website. Sign it if you get a chance. What else did you find? This one I love the most. Uh, it's sad, but this one's from Sidney Blumenthal to Podesta. One important uh, point has been universally acknowledged by the nine previous reports about Benghazi. The attack was almost certainly preventable. Clinton was in charge of the State Department, and it failed to protect U.S. personnel at an American consulate in Libya. If the GOP wants to raise that as a talking point against her, it is legitimate. You know, everything the woman touches turns to crap. Thank you all for tuning into the show tonight. That does it for us. If you're checking us out on YouTube, be sure and hit the subscribe button. We'll see you back here at 7 p.m. Central tomorrow night. Oh, and good job for your first night hosting the news. Thank you. High five.